welcome everyone to the PPC's Guides to GA4. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Nava Hopkins. Uh, I am an absolute uh, data addict. I, I love digging into the hows, the whys, and, and how these things happen. And so one of the reasons why I was really uh, keen to do um, this specific talk, as opposed to diving into maybe some of the specifics um, of GA4 and some of the technical pieces, is that quite a number of the GA4 talks uh, that I've seen, and there have been quite a number of amazing GA4 resources, uh, really spoke to kind of the SEO's side of GA4, but there are some very specific questions that we PPCs have, and there, there wasn't really an opportunity uh, to learn those specific bits of information. So um, I actually selfishly put my hand up to do this talk so that I could dive in and get and kind of find some of these answers. Um, because I mean, GA4 is coming, it's here, or it's here. Um, and one of the things that's kind of interesting is that Google is blasting this big like migrate, it's scary, but we really don't need to panic because at the end of the day, if we haven't already put our data backup plans in place, if we haven't already sorted most of these things, uh, the data that we would quote unquote lose isn't really that mission critical to our business. And so one of the things I really would like for everyone to kind of take away at both at the beginning and at the end uh, is that what data we control and what processes we build are gonna be what serve us best, not the cookie cutter template of UA, not forcing ourselves to use a GA4 if maybe that's not the best answer for us. We really wanna focus on what are the needs that we have as a business. So as I mentioned, there are a number of amazing GA4 resources. I am not going to pretend to be uh, the foremost expert on GA4. The reason, again, that I'm here is I wanted to be an evangelist for PPC and what PPCs need out of GA4. Um, I definitely recommend checking out um, Analytics Mania, MeasureMind. There are some amazing resources there. BC Analytics, Brian Anderson is fantastic. Um, Google's GA4 resources. Um, Search Engine Journal did a really good roundup. PPC Chat, which is a really fantastic Twitter chat. Uh, did a really great roundup. So uh, definitely from this session, go dive into those as well. Um, this session is based off of the things that we PPCs need. Um, and I actually put the question to my uh, LinkedIn network, what are the questions that people have? What are the specifics that if I were to do a deep dive and really ferret out what are those answers, what are people most interested in? And I wasn't really very surprised that uh, audiences was top of mind, foremost because audiences are really where the lion's share of uh, GA4's resources for PPC live. Um, and so we're going to spend quite a bit of time on audiences, the mechanics, how to think about them, um, why maybe you don't want to opt into certain audience settings. Um, the next was templates. Um, I think it's actually very funny that given that GA4 is basically a blank canvas, we all want templates because we all don't want to be the ones to create uh, our, our, our various views. Um, but ultimately, um, there, there are some really interesting templates that have already been uploaded. You can absolutely use um, MeasureMind. You can use um, BC Analytics has also has some really good uh, resources. So definitely check out those. And then reporting. How do we translate um, the metrics that maybe were lost um, into uh, GA4? How do we convey some of the new metrics that are now here that we didn't have before? Things like that. Um, I did want to touch on setup because there are some things that from the PPC side, um, we do want to factor in as we're setting up our GA4 properties um, and also conversion tracking. And the reason that conversion tracking made this list, even though no one specifically asked about it, is that conversion tracking is actually one of those questions that I had going into this presentation that I really wanted to ferret out an answer for you. And one of the things that was nice about Google Marketing Live is it actually presented quite a number of, of those solutions. So without any further ado, we're going to dive into basically the setup, the things that you want to think about from PPC, some templates, audiences, conversion tracking, and reporting. And if there are questions that you don't have answer today, or there's something that comes up, um, absolutely connect with me. Um, I'll be around after the presentation and we can chat in depth. Uh, so one of the things that's really interesting, um, and I, I did this uh, during the Optimizer PPC Town Hall um, with Bree Anderson um, and Tim Jensen, was a discussion of how much do we actually use the setup assistant within GA4. And what I find really interesting is that people don't like to admit that they use it, but I actually love it. 
because it's a really good checklist to give to clients to make sure that you've absolutely set up everything that you need. Um, and one of the most key ones that's worth discussing is Google Signals. Google Signals will put you um, at odds with GDPR if you do not uh, use it. However, Google Signals is also one of the ways that from a PPC standpoint, you're able to get far more conversion tracking. You're able to build out those audiences a little bit better. It's just, it, it, it helps feed that system. So where do you draw the line? I would argue that for Google Signals, um, and when we're thinking about uh, all those various pieces, um, you really want to think about, A, are you a PPC first marketing channel? If you are, you likely will want to leverage it. If you're not, you likely will not. The other consideration is, are you an international brand or are you domestic? If you are an international brand, um, you can absolutely pick and choose which markets you allow uh, to feed into it. Um, and then I'll go over that a little bit later. Um, otherwise, you will, you will want to just leave it off. Um, the other piece to consider um, is your audiences um, and how you define them. Um, we go, as I mentioned, into this in depth, but this is one of those things that I find that people will kind of check a box and then forget. But GA4 gives us such a width and breadth of audiences that you definitely want to make sure that you set that up. And then finally, with conversion tracking instead of conversions, um, I am a firm, firm believer in using micro and macro conversions. And the reason for that is that PPC as a whole has kind of undergone a socialization, if you if you will, um, where we used to be far more focused on keywords as targets, we now are far more focused on audiences as targets. Um, and similarly, the amount of data needed um, to help a campaign learn and to clear learning periods and to kind of check those boxes for uh, data-driven attribution you want to have some of those micro conversions, even if you treat them as secondary conversions as opposed to primary. So definitely make sure that you're setting up your conversions in GA4 and that you're checking for their validity um, against the native conversion tracking. And we'll get into that in depth. Um, I will say that some of the more important pieces, like linking to BigQuery so that you're able to set up your looker reports, um, backing up your, your existing data, um, all of that is under advanced. The other piece though is importing data. And this is probably the most important piece for PPC. And one of the reasons why it's so important is that from an offline conversion standpoint, enhanced conversions, we wanna make sure that we're able to feed in not just data from our Google campaigns, but also from our other advertising channels. Um, it's not just about what happens on Google. GA4 is really trying to enable us to think beyond. Um, and with that announcement from Google Marketing Live, where enhanced conversions can actually help build customer match lists, it's even more important that we're feeding in that data. So a quick note on data streams versus data sources. Um, this is probably one of the most important pieces for those of you who have uh, maybe, I don't want to say contentious relationship with your SEO teams, but maybe uh, we, we fight a little bit about what the experiences should be. If you are using the same domain as your organic friends, odds are you are probably just going to have the same domain. But if you're using um, a vanity domain, or even if you're doing a subdomain and you wanna have that separate tracking and, and all that extra additional data, you will wanna make sure that you add that in as a data stream. The other piece to bear in mind, and this is very important for those of you, um, whether it's app campaigns or you just wanna be able to track iOS traffic and you're looking at the G braid and W braid, um, you will wanna make sure that you configure your apps correctly um, so that you're able to pull in that information. Very important step on the setup. Um, this is for both GA4 and for tracking uh, in the privacy first world is making sure that your Google Tag Manager is configured correctly and that it can actually take in that information. Um, so again, we want to make sure that our apps are here and all of our various domains. You will get a little alert as you're adding uh, any additional sources aside from your first web stream. Um, you likely will want to ignore it unless uh, you're trying to combine more initiatives than, than you should. So it is possible that it should be a separate property. I, I mean, th there's a discussion to be had there, but for the most part, if you're doing a vanity domain or you do, you're do, you doing um, different country domains, uh, but it's ultimately the same cohort, the same initiatives, 
you will want to have it in, in that same data stream. Now for data imports, um, there are two very important pieces to this. Um, I mean, they're all important, but I, I want to focus on two specifically. Um, the first is our cost data. Um, this is very important so that we can factor in uh, all of our various other channels and that we can actually have reasonable revenue goals um, and, and tracking based off of all of our various PPC initiatives, not just Google. Um, the other piece, and this is really critical, um, it's critical across the board, is our offline event data. Um, we really want to make sure that we're syncing through every possible bit of conversion data that we can um, so that both our campaigns can perform well, but also we're giving that useful information to our other parts uh, of, of the business. So if our SEO friends are part of that conversion path, um, but they're not maybe not necessarily included because the actual conversion happened through something, some other paid initiative, we want to make sure that it comes through. Um, so in terms of what events are we tracking as our true conversion events. These are some examples. You will notice that they are all lowercase. Um, GA4 is very, 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 very strict when it comes to syntax and when it comes to those pieces. By the way, I can see that there are some questions. I'm going to check all the questions at the end. Uh, so we'll, we'll go through those in depth. So definitely keep them coming. Just know that I'll, I'll get to it at the end. Um, the other piece just to bear in mind, though, is that from a uh, micro conversion standpoint, we may want to actually look at first user versus returning user um, pieces to this as well, um, just so that we can start to have that conversation with our PMAX campaigns, say about um, net new customers or that lifetime um, conversion value optimizing for that lifetime conversion value. So um, these are just a general starting point, but we definitely want to make sure that we're building on, on top of them. And we're not forcing ourselves to include conversion events that are not actually mission critical. And as I mentioned, if it doesn't spark joy, if it doesn't yield a uh, profit and victory, we don't need to recreate it. Um, this is a really golden opportunity to clean up a lot of those events, especially given that we can only have 50 um, that we that we include within our GA4. Um, now, I cannot overstate how important it is to audit your Google conversion tracking for primary and secondary conversion actions until you're absolutely positively sure that your conversion tracking is working correctly. Um, as just a general reminder, though I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all know this by now, primary is it will impact the algorithm, it will feed into your reports. Secondary is it will not impact the algorithm and it will not feed into your reports, but you'll still be able to see it. So Nava, why would I do that if I could just not mark it as a conversion? Why would I? Why wouldn't I just use the the Google Ads conversion tracking or the Microsoft conversion tracking or, or whatever? Um, well, the reason for that is at the end of the day, um, data driven attribution uh, and how Google functions and sends all of that uh, tracking data. If we care that we're using the same sources of truth as our other uh, parts of the marketing team, we are going to want to use GA4 events so that it's it's one to one. Um, and if we're only using our own, the numbers are going to look different and it's going to create infighting um, and attribution question, questions. Um, so definitely we want to work towards getting back to using um, an analytics um, event as our conversion tracking, but we don't want to necessarily just flip the switch before we're absolutely positively sure that it's working. So I definitely recommend using your GA4 events as secondary first and using your, your Google Ads ones as, as your primary. And then as you start to see your GA4 ones function and do what good things, you can then swap. Um, you do not want to have multiple, you don't want to have double counting. So you will want to kind of pick and choose and you may set up your GA4 events and decide, hey, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with uh, my native ad tracking and that's perfectly fine. Just bear in mind that it is going to impact your reporting. And on the subject of data-driven attribution, um, last click is really being, even though it's still here and it's still an option, it's really being pushed away. Uh, those of you that attended Google Marketing Live uh, will have heard how they were talking about last click is last year. I remember saying that five years ago, like there's there's a number of things that when it comes to um, attribution that 
we, we, we kind of need to parse out. And one of the things I've always struggled with with data-driven attribution is that its history is helping uh, big companies, enterprise level companies, where you had really big thresholds for success, and suddenly it's available for everyone. So one of the things uh, that Google, and this is a, a, a Google uh, description of it. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, answer. Just bear in mind, uh, the graphic is, is from Google. Uh, that when we're thinking about uh, our data driven attribution versus last click, Data driven attribution uses modeling, like what we we're talking about before. It is possible for that to be wrong, especially if you have a tiny data set. So you may decide that you want to be on last click until you get to um, certain thresholds. And that's perfectly fine because Google will still feed the Google Ads credit into the algorithm, even if it, the thing that, that it was or, the, or the, the conversion action didn't actually yield the last click before the conversion. So you only need to switch to data-driven attribution when you are truly ready. Now, the thresholds are not nearly as bad as they used to be, um, honestly, so long as you're hitting 1,000 to 3,000 uh, folks to your site every 30 days, you probably, uh, or rather the or impressions, uh, you're, you're, you're probably fine. Um, but where it maybe would be a little bit more tricky is if you're, say, getting 10 people to your site. Odds are you're, you're going to hit modeling issues, you're going to hit thresholding issues. So that's where um, pragmatically you may still want to be on last click, even though last click is really not that helpful. One other note just about um, data-driven attribution. Data-driven attribution at the end of the day is just a reporting tool. You will have fractional conversions. That doesn't mean you have fractional customers. So it is very important to explain uh, to, to your uh, clients, to your stakeholders, that just because it says uh, 0.8, it doesn't mean you have 0.8 of a customer. It just means that this particular um, entity was responsible for 0.8% or 0.8% of, of the conversion. Um, now, on look back windows, this is very, very important. Um, you will need to set it to 30 days and 90 days as opposed to the seven days as default and 30 days as default. Um, what I strongly recommend for uh, anyone other than, say, like impulse purchases, you will want that, that full look back window. And also you're gonna to wanna to make sure that from an event, a conversions tracking standpoint, you're tracking unique conversions, not every, um, because again, with GA4 and how much we have to kind of lean into micro conversions, you're not gonna necessarily want every single conversion action flowing through. Um, so as I mentioned, be sure that you're tracking what you need for your business. This means tracking customers. This means tracking useful actions. It does not mean tracking every single little thing on the, the, the site as a conversion action. You might track it as a regular action and it might be part of your SEO conversation, but you're not going to need to track it as a conversion action. Uh, so the next bit is actually diving into our missing metrics um, and one of the or and uh, audiences. So one of the things that I, I was really uh, keen on with this is we when we were used to GA4's rollout, uh, we're used to a lot more things being missing than they actually are. So I strongly recommend every single one of you take the time, maybe an hour out of your week, go through, click the edit button on your reports and just go and go through all the possible metrics that are available now um, based off of events and triggers that you've set. So, so long as you have purchase um, as set up as an event, as long as you're uh, capturing uh, the, the value, you will have a, a revenue metric uh, to, to piece through. So there, there's quite a number of metrics that are actually available that you that maybe weren't available before that we're just in the habit of assuming aren't there. Um, the other thing that I, I will point out, GA4 is so useful at asking it questions. Now, it is not necessarily going to be able to answer every single question, and it will sometimes go after the wrong information, um, but there are quite a number of really useful, useful questions that you can ask the data um, that 
you don't even need to build a, a card for, you don't even need to build a report for, you can just ask um, the GA for that question. And I strongly recommend getting in that, in that habit because this is gonna be something very useful you can start to give to your clients because rather than having to build a full report, you can start getting in the habit of, okay, these are the strategic questions I ask my account every month and then I'm, I'm tasked to report back on. Here's a really useful way to position it and then you get a really beautiful graph uh, to share that with, with your clients. All of these questions are dependent on having the correct syntax so that you don't have undefined uh, signals, undefined metrics. So the most common reason that you will get undefined is that you have lowercase or that you haven't formatted it correctly. Now, Looker is going to be an option for you for the missing metrics, but I would actually argue that we don't necessarily need all of them. So bounce, uh, bounce rate, bounce sessions. I, I'm less concerned about retaining that than I am, say, engage sessions per user. And the reason for that is that I don't necessarily care about the bounce rate because that, that can be both a, a positive or a negative. I care how much are, are my uh, people actually engaging with, with me and, and, and uh, my content? Uh, so from an SEO standpoint, yes, it sucks that bounce rate is no longer there, but you can essentially get it with uh, engaged sessions per user. But if you do want to recreate it, it is absolutely still possible in Looker. And as I mentioned, syntax is really important. Um, so from a source, a medium standpoint, we really want to make sure that we are using the exact same naming schemes. Um, if you do not, you are going to get undefined. And that is typically the lion's share of where you might get stuck. Um, the other piece just to bear in mind when you're working through um, setting up your, your tracking, uh, a lot of people have already done the work of creating all these various events and all and, and uh, UTM builders, you don't need to do all this yourself. Human error is the most common cause of undefined. So definitely be empowered, borrow from other people. It's totally fine. Uh, just this is typically why you're getting undefined. Um, and the other piece, uh, just to bear in mind, uh, as I mentioned, if you're a small site, you're going to struggle with getting modeling. Um, the other piece to this, though, is if you are not able to uh, work on uh, growing your site, like your site is always going to be small, you may want to look at other analytic solutions that don't require the width and breadth of data uh, that GA4 requires. Uh, GA4 is a hybrid solution between enterprise and kind of SMB SaaS turnkey solution. Um, if you're too small for that and there's that doesn't mean that you do small business, it just means that there's not a lot of people that come to your site. Uh, it is okay to look at other solutions. So campaign ID is missing help. Um, this is just a matter of making sure that your GCLID um, is set up correctly. Um, and this is done under custom definitions. Uh, you'll wanna make sure that you have your GCLID there and that you set up uh, the property as Google Ads. Um, this is a, a simple little thing that sometimes uh, goes missing. And so long as you have your GCLID set up, or your G braids it up, um, W braids it up, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, I will say though, with, with your um, IDs, the more and more that we switch to uh, performance max, where the idea of our creative or our audiences or our keyword or our search terms being a privacy question, I would not be surprised if eventually we have to kind of eat not being able to see that information, not because Google doesn't want to show it, but because it's regulated out, that we're not able to know the exact thing that resulted in a customer. This is not today. Um, it is still very possible uh, to achieve this, but it, it is just something to consider. Uh, so on audiences, and I, as I promised, this is going to be the lion's share of, of what, what we dig into. Um, this is where the majority of our utility is. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend just digging through every single uh, source and then various mediums um, really flesh out all, all the, the various things that you can do uh, with audiences because there, there's quite a number. Um, but at the same time, I also caution you that audiences 
um, can only be used if for targeting purposes if they are big enough and they control can uh, contain enough users so for example this audience i could not use with 191 users i could not use for targeting i'd have to have at least a thousand um, so if you're going to build an audience please make sure that you're setting it yourself up for success um, and also when we uh, create each of these different criteria, um, there are some criteria that are going to have higher value. There are some criteria that are going to have lower value. Um, so when we think about affinity audiences, and this was a study I did back in 2019, uh, back when I was at uh, WordStream, uh, we looked at, at uh, the cost acquisition for each audience. And yeah, no audience did worse. But what's interesting is that affinity did almost as, as badly. Um, and it's also worth noting that from a uh, in-market standpoint, so Google signals, that was right behind affinity. So there are certain signals that can sometimes be correct and sometimes not. So the most useful thing I, I can tell you when it comes to audiences is treat audiences as signals, not targets. Um, and you will have a much easier time. Additionally, treat audiences as negatives to proactively exclude rather than target. Uh, because when you're using an audience to exclude and to shape your audience, it's a lot easier to get rid of the waste rather than going after the chosen because the chosen might not have enough people and you'll have thresholding issues and then you're not gonna be able to serve. Which as I mentioned uh, with thresholding, um, one of the things that we all got very excited about with um, uh, GA4 is predictive audiences, uh, that someone who was likely to churn, someone who was likely to buy, all these things. I have to tell you, for a lot of the, the smaller folks that I work with, they don't have access to these audiences. And the reason for it is that they do not meet the minimums. So just so that you have it as a handy dandy cheat sheet, um, you need to have at least a thousand returning uh, users, you need to have continued volume, and you need to be collecting the purchase and value data. Um, if you do not do those things, you are going to uh, hit, hit an issue. Uh, so uh, I know we're coming close to time. Uh, we also wanna talk about templates. Uh, I cannot recommend go enough checking whether your uh, GA4 link is still sending data correctly. Now, sometimes people do this through the API. Sometimes they'll do it through a, di a direct linking. Um, you want to make sure that it's that it's set correctly. Um, the other piece to this, though, and this is very, very, very important, so those audiences that you uh, allow to be imported in, if they cannot be used for targeting. It doesn't matter that you apply them in Google Ads, that they're not gonna work. So you may find yourself doing a lot more observation and putting them in as Pmax as a signal, especially in the early days of a campaign to help teach it, um, than you actually do for uh, targeting. What you may find though, is that your placement, so uh, getting a sense even of uh, where your ads may, uh, or the, the revenue that you get on your site, or kind of what, what kind of revenue you're, you're driving there. That could be an, an idea of potential landing pages uh, to include in a, in a placement exclusion or a placement targeting report. Um, now, in terms of how are campaigns performing, um, I definitely recommend using the conversational reporting piece just to get those ideas. Um, what you'll notice though, if we ask how are my PPC campaigns performing, you'll see that GA4 is not quite sure what I mean by that. So the more specific the ask and the more specific the prompt uh, ties in a, a, a metric that you've already put into GA4, uh, the better chance you'll have. Uh, now, when we're looking at, for example, the life cycle and acquisition versus um, overview, overview is typically where most of us will go and, and that's totally fine. If you need a little bit more of a breakdown, um, Brie Anderson uh, has a really handy dandy uh, walkthrough of actually adding all of the paid search. I'm not going to pretend to, to uh, take the credit for, for that walkthrough. It's a really it's a really good one. Um, link is uh, at the front. Um, but that that walkthrough uh, will help you keep the, your PPC pieces right at the forefront. Um, and then finally, don't be afraid to play with the cards uh, that, that are available. Um, when we see, for example, uh, the, the templates, 
and, and how we can segment that information. Uh, it is very important that as you're building, you're building towards what you and your business needs as opposed to, uh, I'm gonna just add it for the sake of, just because it was in universal analytics. Um, so the, the long and short of this presentation is build what you need um, don't force yourself to build metrics that you don't actually need. Um, and with that, uh, I am happy to take any questions and I will dive into the questions now. So um, I have a site, uh, an app site. Oh, Phil, did you want to moderate the questions? Uh, sure. Uh, the, okay. uh, in, in terms of timing, though, um, we're actually, oh, we've got five minutes. Uh, so I'll read out the two questions that have been asked in chat. So the first one, uh, is is about uh, uh, someone's set up uh, um, GA4 with two streams. So they said, if I have site.com and app.site.com, uh, uh, as I think I mean a single page application site, uh, how should I set it up as two streams? Um, I it, think they're gone. Uh, I, I would actually recommend having two streams. Um, but the reason I would do that is because specifically app. If it was anything else, I would probably have it as a single stream. But my assumption is that that's an app or like you're building an app. Yeah, I, I think the, I mean, if, if it's Firebase, it has to be a separate stream. But if they're using uh, a, uh, a web wrapper, in theory, they could create a web stream for a, for a, uh, an app. Um, I think yeah. that the, I mean, the bigger problem there is more about uh, cross domain tracking uh, and and siloing and separating and, and kind of lack of of, of, of uh, filtered views. Um, I mean, what we sometimes do is do a, a different account uh, um, when sites need to do roll ups and uh, um, like country trackers or, or like folder trackers. Um, uh, the uh, but that, that's more of an uh, uh, analytics question rather than a, a PPC one. But there is a PPC one here where it's they've um, someone's asked. I assume uh, that we do not need to register the GCL ID in GA4. Uh, the GCL ID. No, you do. You do. Um, and, and this is where people see the missing campaign ID. Um, if you don't put that in for GA4 to track and, and configure your Google Tag Manager to pick up that information, um, it sometimes goes missing. And that's where sometimes you'll have PPC traffic linked into either direct or undefined. So that that is why it has to you have to go in and add it. Um, and I, the, the reason I'm so forceful about this is that I actually experienced it with one of my clients. Um, they kind of trusted to the auto tagging process and, and auto linking. And if us put, configuring the the GCL within GA4 solved it. So um, Phil, I don't know if you've seen different differently, but that that's. Um, yeah, uh, um, and, and um, uh, Matteo uh, uh, is actually doing a talk about specifically that problem uh, uh, um, uh, in, in uh, coming up later. Yeah, what we normally do is we uh, we do the GCID, leave that enabled, but also do the final URL suffix where we do UTM medium equals CPC and source equals Google, basically to cap, count both. Um, and sometimes we also would grab the GCLID and push it into the UTM ID field, as in the campaign code, uh, um, so that it, it doesn't use up a custom dimension slot. But but yeah, I, I get what you're saying. You don't want to under-report under paid search, uh, um, especially given that these, these not provided landing pages and and certain like nuances where it like, you know, it sounds crazy given that why would GA4 under-report paid search given his Google? Um, but uh, it's kind of necessary to, to use these these uh, solutions to prevent undercounting. Uh, um, uh, I'm going to read out one last question. Then, then we'll. Uh, I'm going to uh, potentially jump over uh, uh, into the, the the networking lounge. So uh, John Woods has has uh, asked a great talk. Uh, um, Nava, um, uh, uh, he's part of a, an agency with multiple B2B PPC clients. They're seeing some cases where uh, J4 uh, remarketing audiences don't sync to Google Ads even though the setup seems correct. Uh, low uh, volume site, uh, but above the minimums, uh, have you seen anything similar to that? The only thing I can think of, and this is tricky with B2B because I can't think of how you would fall into any of these categories is that you may not be allowed to use remarketing. Um, like it might just be a policy piece. Um, the other sometimes reason why this will happen is if, uh, some of your uh, tracking in terms of the audience 
uh, it's just not collecting information. So if it's if it's collecting information and it's synced through, or you've you've sent it through to, to sync, um, I would guess it's either a policy issue that it's not allowed, um, or you're not actually getting enough people. So the vault the site volume might be fine, but the settings of the audience are not allowing enough. Um, but I'm happy to to discuss that because that seems like a very specific question. So I'm I'm happy to discuss that one on one with you later. Mm. So uh, uh, with that, I'm just going to take over presenter control just for a moment. The uh, so in in um, uh, uh, John, if you want to uh, sort of ask uh, um, uh, the speakers direct questions, we've got this networking space called Como. So uh, uh, Nava, if you could uh, navigate to the, the the place with your picture in. Uh, uh, in there, uh, you've got to move, use the up and down arrow keys to sort of, uh, uh, move through it. And uh, once you're in there, um, we'll mark you as the default uh, uh, sort of uh, room. Uh, um, so, um, uh, if uh, Chris or Wilk, if you just post the that bit link it just into chat. Now, um, uh, uh, so so uh, thank you so much for for doing that talk. Lots of kind of interesting uh, uh, pieces and, and learnings and experience there. Um, just as a reminder, because lots of uh, attendees are asking this, uh, for the the slides, um, uh, we're going to uh, uh, add them to the thank you pages of the speaker surveys, but it's not going to be until uh, end of play tomorrow. So uh, you don't necessarily need to fill in the speaker uh, surveys yet. For in some instances, if we've got the, the speaker slides, we'll add them as soon as we can, but but just wait until end of play tomorrow. Uh, for, for recordings, we're going to do those in batches uh, with uh, two uh, uh, recordings per week uh, uh, for a four-week period. So uh, you're not going to miss out on anything, but if people can subscribe to the YouTube channel to get notifications about recordings and uh, or, or the newsletter to get notifications about uh, um, uh, um, that as those as well. 